Hello everyone, we're back again with another video, but today is a little bit different. We are going to be interviewing Dr. Ankur Verma. Ankur has trained in emergency medicine at the George Washington University and is currently a principal consultant and faculty of emergency medicine at the Max Super Specialty Hospital in New Delhi, India. He has a keen interest in trauma, airways, academic EM, resuscitation, and point of care ultrasound. He has published many papers in national and international scientific journals and has also also given many talks nationally and internationally. Dr. Ankur is also the president at Society for Emergency Medicine India, Delhi chapter. He's also the creator slash founder of the Desi EM project, India's first and only emergency medicine podcast heard in over 60 countries. He's a self-taught nutritionist and is trying to create awareness regarding the species-specific diet, lifestyle, and root causes of non-communicable diseases, specifically chronic non-communicable diseases. So we're just going to jump directly into this interview. I hope you guys enjoy it, and we will waste no further time getting into it. So, let's get started. Okay, so, Ankur, um, what brought you to Carnivore? Uh, hi, Adi. Uh, so, basically, three years back, uh, when I got my test done, this post, post-COVID post illness, I saw my triglycerides at 600. And then I realized that, you know, I have no damn idea about nutrition. Uh, I, I, I knew sugars are bad for us. I knew junk food's bad for us, but we would still eat it. And uh, as, as a doctor, I would always advise a balanced diet. But if somebody would have asked me what a balanced diet was, I don't think I would have had, I would have been able to explain that to them because we never trained in nutrition. But then I started deep diving into nutrition. You know, I started off with uh, Professor Lustig's book called Metabolical. And then I understood a little bit more about metabolic syndromes. And uh, so I was 86 kilos at that time. And my triglycerides were 600. Not that I was never working out. I used to exercise, but then I used to eat everything possible, you know just to get in the calories in as the gym mm -hmm. trainers tell you, you know, eat as many calories as you can because you're working out so much. But then obviously I, I cut down uh, my, my on my sugars and processed food for sure. And I brought down my carbohydrate intakes. And I was basically calorie counting for the first year or something like that using all the apps. And uh, I, I, was, I managed to cut down like about 20, 21 kgs. But if you see my pictures, even from that that time you could you could make out inflammation on my face even after losing 21 kilos uh and and slowly then i started getting into uh, so I, I always loved my meats so basically when even when i was doing a calorie count i was i was more of a keto uh keto enthusiast and i was eating you know, more of my meats and uh really counting the carb intakes that i was taking you know, basically rice was the one that i was taking and then obviously somebody sent me Paul Saladino's and that happens to everybody. Uh, one of his reels when he was 100% carnivore and uh, it intrigued me and you know I, I, I started studying a little bit more. I read through more papers, I read through more books and I completely understood what animal meats are all about and how, how uh, we've never understood nutrition, not that we needed to but then we've been actually made to understand the wrong side of nutrition for whatever reasons we all know that but it was easy for me because you know i've like i mentioned i've always loved my meats so and i was I'd, I'd already cut down my carbohydrate intake so i just had to remove that which i did and this was uh, april last year and uh, no looking back since then yeah i've been living the carnival lifestyle it's been fun uh, it's it's opened up my brains a lot my mind my eyes uh, reversed reversed a few things, a few symptoms which I thought was natural for all of us as we're growing up, you know, a lot of heartburns and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, GERD symptoms, uh, even soreness after workouts. That was something that was, that was uh, quite intriguing for me, you know. My recovery post-exercise was so much better. I mean, I, I'd never have the soreness anymore after uh, a heavy workout, you know. Uh, a lot of yeah, I mean, my sleep's much better, my libido's much better. So you know, I mean, a lot of things that I actually thought was age-related just disappeared, and then I was like, okay, fine. I was having symptoms. My body was actually telling me something's not right, uh, and I'm pretty sure that you know I'm going to I'm going to uh, discover more symptoms later on once once they reverse. You know? Right. So yeah, so yeah, kind of was the thing to go to. Yeah. So six hundred triglycerides. That's pretty. That's pretty high. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't yeah, think my, I've my, ever heard of anyone <laughs> having that high my, of triglycerides before. Yeah. Um, yeah. My TG. My my TG to HDL ratio was sixteen point eight six. Wow. 
Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to, so were you already on a balanced diet whenever you had, or what's colloquially deemed balanced because that's so vague, that's so broad, it can mean anything, right? Were you already on sort of what people would call a prototypical balanced diet when you had those triglycerides or were you told to go on that type of diet when you presented with those triglycerides or with, with that number? No, so for me, I think I was having everything. I was having my meats, yeah. which was protein and my fats, but I was also having a lot of carbohydrates and vegetables and fibers and all of that. I mean, the standard Indian diet is predominantly carbohydrate and fiber loaded. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I was still, you, you can say I was still an outlier in terms of uh, meat intakes because uh, I used to have my meats every day, but then obviously it was accompanied by a lot of carbohydrates and fiber also. So now I would have my chicken, I would have my mutton, which is goat, seafood, eggs, all of that. But, you know, right. eggs would be with, with probably breads. Yeah. You know, uh, my, my chicken or my mutton would be with rice or rotis and chapatis. Right. Always, you know. So, yeah. And, and so that was basically the balanced diet um, uh, that uh, a lot of authorities actually recommend. But it didn't help. So, yeah, so you're residing in India. You're born and raised there. Uh, is that the... So when you talk about... So that I'm sure that that's part of... That's a predominant part of the culture in terms of its food is a lot of meat, but also a lot of... Would you say a lot of bread, starchy type stuff, you know, rice and all that other stuff? Uh, are there any other staples that could have been contributed or that you were having in your diet that could have contributed as well to such a uh, high triglyceride number and a <laughs> metabolic derangement you could say <laughs> yeah i think so i mean uh uh processed foods for sure i mean i still okay. love my cheetos and doritos but that would that was not like a normal thing i mean when we used to have parties we would have uh the chips and stuff and uh, the cheetos and all uh pizzas and burgers would be going on you know once a week or twice a week not every day obviously but then you have people people forget that everything else is also processed you know the rice is processed right. the dals yeah. or the lentils are processed uh, the breads are processed, all of that, you know, so, I mean, even if I was not having junk food for, for maybe a week or 10 days, I would still be having the natural junk foods. Right. Uh, that's, right. that's not, uh, good for us. So right. that definitely contributed. And, and, and the whole of India, we have a massive carbohydrate intake, you know, I mean, you, you could easily say 70 to 80% of our, uh, caloric intake or just, you know, 70 to 80% of our diets, uh, is carbohydrate right. and uh, uh, be it South India, be it North, North India, East or West, you know, I mean, the breakfast starts off with a lot of carbs, you know, we, we, there are, there are staple dishes and the cuisines which start off with carbohydrates. So, yeah, I mean, that definitely contributed to it. Yeah, I was going to I was going to start talking about India because uh, from my very cursory reviewing, um, China is the country that has the most diabetes rates per capita in the world right now. Um, but one of the highest countries is India. I think the I just recently I just copied and pasted this just so I could have the stats on the screen. The estimates epidemiologically in 2019 showed that 77 million individuals had diabetes in India. Uh, and it's expected to rise over 134 million by 2045. And so it says approximately 57%. And we talked about this in the uh, interview that we had about two weeks ago, where you interviewed me. Uh, it was off the uh, it was off the camera, so to speak. But you know, it was fifty seven percent of these individuals remain undiagnosed. You were talking about that yeah. because of your your profession, you know how many people go on un, un, undiagnosed, and the population of India is one point four one seven billion. So that's a little over five percent. But if you look at the stats, that's actually pretty significant. I think China is about ten or eleven percent of their population. So why do you think so many people go undiagnosed? First of all, I actually want to talk about that. Again, we talked about yeah. that before, but why do you think so many people go undiagnosed? Yeah, I think, first of all, you know, the numbers that are out there are really a massive underestimation. Uh, even even in the papers uh, published in Lancet, you know, it, it claims that 11% of the population is uh, diagnosed as diabetes, right? But right. Uh, if you look at other papers that come out, you know, all of these are epidemiological studies. Uh, they're all cohort surveys and stuff. So, I mean, there are rural versus urban papers where the urban sector had 54% who were diabetic and 47% in the rural sector, which had uh, uh, diabetes, you know. Uh, there, there, there are other studies, even in tribal women, where it showed 40% of the women had diabetes. And uh, this is just data coming out from about 20 institutes in India, just 20 to 25 institutes in India. 
uh, publish their data. And uh, we, we are quite a big country. You know, we've got thousands of institutes, a lot of medical colleges, a lot of medical hospitals, you know, medical college hospitals where a lot of rural uh, uh, population uh, uh, go and, and visit. And, uh, and, then, and then you have all the major cities with a lot of private hospitals. And if all of them put in their data, I'm 110% sure it'll be way more than 30, 40%. Even some systematic reviews have shown that one in three individuals in India have metabolic syndrome, and one of the criteria for metabolic syndrome is hyperglycemia, right? Uh, depending on what definition you want to use. But uh, I, I definitely take metabolic syndrome as somebody who's having problems with their blood sugars, for sure. So, I mean, yeah, so so these numbers are an underestimate. I mean, even in my, in my uh, department where we're doing uh, research, uh, so about 25% uh, of the population that's come in since we started this paper, uh, I mean this research in April, 25% of them uh, were diagnosed diabetic. So we're just taking all the patients who are coming in with NCDs and we're asking them what they eat and their diet preference basically, not the food items that they eat, uh, but you know, vegetarian or non-vegetarian or omnivores, uh, over-vegetarians or pescatarians. And then we're going into the NOVA groups of the food uh, uh, the food chain and all of that and uh, whatever alcohol drugs smoking you know do they eat carbs or not and even out of the, that population so we've got about 2500 patients uh, included in the study till now and 53 percent of them are diabetic uh, but if you take the total footfall it's about 25 percent who've been included into the study now again, this twenty-five percent is only the people who've consented for the study and were included, right? Out of the total footfall that came to our department, but there were a lot of others where my teammates forgot to take uh, to include them into the study, or they were so busy that you know they didn't go to those patients. There were a lot of people who uh, who who were declared dead on arrival who were diabetic, uh, and obviously we didn't ask them to fill up the survey. So you know the numbers could easily be around thirty thirty-five percent of the population that's coming to my department to have diabetes. And there's just one institute. And in my yeah. neighboring area, there'll be about 25 to 30 different hospitals. Yeah. So you can imagine the numbers. But yeah, again, access to healthcare uh, is something that's, even, even after having so many hospitals, access to healthcare is uh, it's still difficult for a lot of people uh, who then again go undiagnosed with diabetes or pre-diabetes. And then again, medical science, or I shouldn't say medical science, but medical education still doesn't focus on the real problems of metabolic syndrome and diabetes. You, this, you still wait for the blood sugar level and the HPA1C to diagnose somebody who's, who's, who's diabetic, right? I mean, all the, all the health panels and the tests that are done, even the pre-health checkups, they look at HPA1C and, and, and blood sugar, and now we know that these are probably the last ones to rise up. You right. know, I mean, yeah. we're, not, we're not taught to test insulin levels. We're not taught to check the CRPs and the cortisol levels. Now people have started checking these, accepting insulin. You have the panels, you know, the tests are there. It's not that the tests are not available. Everybody has the test, but people still don't understand the significance of it. So if, I think if, if people started testing their fasting and their PP postprandial insulin levels, these numbers will shoot up, even the ones that you just copy, uh, copied and, and read off the screen. Those numbers can change in a year, for sure. Right. Yeah. If people started testing their insulin levels, 110%. Right. So, so can you go into the specifics of what your profession does involve? You know, what, what do you do and what types of patients do you work with um, in, your, yeah. in your institution particularly? So I'm trained in emergency medicine. Uh, and I've been practicing emergency medicine since 2008. Uh, so yeah, it's been almost 16 years. And uh, you know, uh, like all lock, like all ERs, we deal with a lot of trauma patients, and we deal with a lot of uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. But uh, the maximum number of patients that we look at are complications of these non-communicable diseases and complications of the medications that they might be on. Uh, so, so we have a lot of patients coming in with diabetic complications like something called diabetic ketoacidosis or hypoglycemia if they overdose on insulin or they forget to take insulin, which is, I think, one of the worst drugs possible. Uh, I mean, it's not required for type 2 diabetes, but uh, you still want to sell them. 
and then you have uh, we we have a lot of heart attacks coming in we have a lot of aortic dissection staring up of the aorta that can be because of hypertension we have a lot of hypertensive crisis coming in like uh, bleeds in the brain or just angina uh, uh, anginal symptoms you know accelerated hypertension uh, we we get a lot of uh, pancreatitis you know i mean that's again related to your pancreas and your insulin a lot of gallbladder stones again i i've i've noticed that a lot of uh pa- patients who have who, who probably would be b12 and choline deficient uh, would end up with uh, calculus we still have to do our research on that we'll have we'll have a lot of kidney stones a lot of kidney stones and ureteric uh, stones and you know i've started asking them what do they eat and i just give them this checklist of these oxalate foods and they're like yep we have all of that like, perfect you know the other doctors will just tell you to drink more water but uh, they they wouldn't know about this so yeah i mean a, a lot of non communicable disease strokes we get a lot of strokes we have a lot of patients who come in with hypothyroid issues uh, uh alzheimers dementia cancers that's something that i'm noticing because because now every hospital has an oncology department and uh, you know we have a lot of patients who are on chemo or radio and and surgery and i've just i've just noticed you know that onco surgery uh, it's not going to save you you know i mean i've seen i've seen onco surgeons do massive surgeries and you know amazing amazing surgeries to moving all the tumors and this that, but they end up removing a lot of your normal organs also uh you know and and you end up with so many more complications and 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 none of the oncologists understand and it's not their fault because they were never taught but you know uh they don't understand the the other the other metabolic theory about how cancers uh, develop and how they can actually be treated or or prevented so yeah but i i'm trying to i'm trying to get into preventive healthcare again uh, that that was something i was taught to us you know i mean as as kids also prevention is better than cure we all knew but we didn't know what exactly and or how exactly should we prevent these diseases you know uh now now we know uh, or pr- probably even if we did know people didn't want us to know uh sort of you know i mean just just mask that with the whole propaganda but uh, yeah so these are the kind of patients that we see every day and 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 it, i mean it, it it's quite sad because you know uh now that we speak to our patients now that i speak to my patients you know most of them 65% of them are pure vegetarians not even having junk food by the way not even having junk food because a lot of them have religious issues so don't, they don't even eat junk food you know they have a lot of carbohydrate intake and a lot of fiber intake and they coming in with b12 deficiencies today i had a 35 year old female come in with a thrombus which is basically a blood clot all the way from her inferior vena cava to her left thigh and she could have had an embolus any time and brought, and could have been brought in cardiac arrest her b12 level was just 117 and her homocysteine was about 25 or 26 which was more than double the upper limit uh and and that was the reason i mean when i met her i'm like are you a pure vegetarian she's like yeah i am but you know i eat healthy i'm like clearly again how how is it that you're eating healthy uh, and and told her you know i'm going to send your b12 and i'm going to send your homocysteine levels and this is the reason why you've had this you're just 35 years old you've not had any surgery you haven't traveled from anywhere so you know your chances of a deep vein thrombosis is zero you know as per the medical criteria but i'm telling you the metabolic criteria for it and this is going to come out positive and it did you know uh when i told her should i get you some eggs <laughs> once it came it's like no I'll probably go home and see if i can have some eggs i was like yeah take it easy i mean you know i mean i'm not asking you to change overnight but then if you don't want this to happen again in your life you'll have to do something about it or go on to medications and then microdose on cyanide that'll be your, that's what your doctors are going to give you yeah yeah so i recently for some reason it was recently i should have known this but um i didn't put two and two together that one of the reasons why there's such a high diabetes rate in india is because one of the reasons why there's so much carbohydrate con- consumption is because there's a large vegetarian population there due to religious beliefs um yeah. in in india as a whole and i was almost inclined the last time we were talking to say well hey here's some evidence that these western problems that started as western problems like atherosclerosis and these huge diabetes rates um have now just been starting to spread to other countries except 
And that's that's true for some countries, except you also said last time that in your own studying and reviewing that India has started to succumb to these far before industrialization occurred in the Western world and then throughout the entire world. Um, can you talk more about what you saw? You said that it, it didn't just start after the industrialization and of the of the food supply. It's sort of there's been there's evidence that has already been a thing in India, the, the metabolic disorders and derangement and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, 380, uh, the first two physicians in India, Charaka and Samhita, uh, Charaka and Sushruta, they've documented like about 12, 15 types of diabetes, 380, right? Uh, and in the 1800s, uh, when uh, we were occupied by the British, uh, the, the, the Surgeon Generals have documented in the Indian Medical Gazette regarding uh, diabetes in uh, the Bengalis and uh, the South Indians in India who have, and basically they've written the rice-eating populations of India. Now in the 1800s, we, I don't think we had polished rice at that time. We would have had whole rice or you know whole grains uh, that would have been, yes, uh, we were one of the first ones to invent sugar from sugar cane. Uh, that was about 3,000 years ago. And uh, that that also could have called, contributed to it. But they were very particular in, in actually documenting the rice intake in these. So Bengalis are known to love their sweets. You know, Bengali sweets are really, really famous. So I'm pretty sure that there was a combination of rice and sweets. The South Indians don't have as many sweets as Bengalis do. They do, they do love their rice, though. You know, they start off the day with rice. You know, they have lemon rice and curd rice and all of that. And it's been going on for years. So, I mean, diabetes came to India way before industrialization, processed foods and seed oils and junk food came to India, you know. Uh, probably the numbers were less and, and we don't know the numbers, obviously, because at that time, I don't think we had so many cohort studies or e even observational studies. But I mean, it, it's been very clearly documented uh, that, that India had uh, a rate of diabetes in people who were actually eating uh, rice. Again, they had, I think, there was another one in the 1700s where they compared North India, which was Punjab, which uh, who consumed a lot of uh, milk, milk products and ghee uh, as compared to the rest of India who were consuming more of rice. And these guys in the north had lesser incidence of diabetes or probably no incidence of diabetes as compared to the Bengalis in the east of India and uh, the Madrasis, that's what they used to call them at that time uh, in, in, in southern India. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's been there for a while and even today most of my patients who are diabetic are vegetarians who have a carb loaded diet and very few yeah. processed foods yeah. yeah and that's including the the inclusion of fibrous foods as well because a lot of people will say oh, yeah. you know yeah they'll say things like um a good way of getting rid of diabetes without having to stop the carbohydrate consumption, which is already a problem in and of itself, uh, is to eat a lot of fibrous foods because that'll blunt the glucose spike. But then if you have all these people that are consuming a lot of fibrous carbohydrates, yeah. you know, and they're still coming down with, I mean, I, from what I, from what I understand, it's not like slight diabetes. I mean, they're, they're very diabetic, these people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then you've got to come to terms with that and say, okay, well, that's not enough at least. It's at the, at the very least not enough. So... One of the things I'm going to sort of transgress away from carnivore a little bit, just it's with one question, because I, I have always thought about this personally, working in the medical profession, no matter what your position is, there are, of course, positions that are harder and more difficult than others mentally and, and, and also, you know, well, actually, mainly mentally, you know, whether you have to do either perform surgeries or some procedure or just dealing with certain clients and stuff like that. Um, how difficult is it to perform your profession, given what it involves and the responsibility you have to take, just even mentally? That's a good question. I mean, emergency physicians, a lot of studies have shown that emergency physicians have the highest rate of burnouts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because cause we deal with uh, a lot of death, a lot of sickness. And, you know, these are undifferentiated patients. Like, you know, surgeons would get probably just one fourth of the patients that come to us. Cardiologists will get just a few patients that come to us, you know. Uh, the trauma surgeons would get only the trauma patients. But we get to see everything from a child dying to somebody who we save. And, you know, we, we have to make split-second decisions uh, for our patients and to think on uh, on our feet. And it's, just, it's not just that, but uh, we are a very dynamic, open speciality, you know. Uh, the whole community sees us and the whole hospital also keeps an eye on us. 
right? Uh, you know what we're doing, how we're doing that, and the, and we're also the window to the hospital for the rest of the community. And in, in today's day of private healthcare, that matters a lot. You know, I mean, they want patients to come into every hospital, right? So they want the ER to be manned properly and you know to be treated properly, and and they want us to work the best that we can, and and they do provide us with all the support. But then again. There, there's a lot of communication that that happens you know i mean we communicate not just with the patients but a multitude of their attendants uh the all the family members the other specialties the juniors the seniors our own colleagues our nurses uh you know uh, uh the security even advocates lawyers the police uh, when we have medical legal cases coming in or trauma you know, trauma cases coming in you have the media that can come in any time uh, you have the medical administration, so you know there's a lot of multitasking happening. Uh, you have the other uh, non-clinical departments like radiology and the labs that we need to keep communicating with to get scans done, or to or, or we need rushed up uh, labs for somebody. So yeah, so and all of that has to be done. And then again, you need to satisfy the patient who 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 thinks or, or who would you know probably give a review for how he or she was treated in the in, in the emergency and then review the hospital also. So, and, and if they don't give a good review, we're supposed to do a root cause analysis, you know, <laughs> as to where we went wrong. And it usually comes down to communication skills and, you know, trigger points. I mean, no doctor goes to the emergency department thinking today I'm going to blast somebody, right? But if somebody comes and, you know, keeps talking to us or asks us the wrong questions all the time, uh, a doctor who's so busy can get a li little irritated. Right. So, yeah. so yeah. I mean, it is definitely difficult. Physically, it's not that difficult, but mentally, it can get. And, and then again, you have to keep thinking. You know, this patient should not crash. I, I, I need to save this guy's life. I have to do these procedures. Oh, and all of that. So yeah, it's it's pretty tough. But uh, we work as a team, and uh, we're always there for each other. So you know, we have a lot of closed loop communication, which is really important. And uh, we we support each other in whatever we do as a team. Right. Well, it also helps that you have as much experience as you do, because you said you've been doing it since 2008, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's been quite a while. I mean, I'm sure that whenever yeah. you started, it was pretty. It was much harder than it is now. It's kind of second yeah, of nature course, to yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know. Yeah. But okay, so so let's talk about the the specifics now of the makeup of your diet. You sort of touched on this already. You you prioritize the meats, and and it's it seems pretty diverse. It's not simply only ruminant meat. There there seems to be a misconception yeah. where. Um, a lot of people think that carnivore is only eating meat, red meat, every single day for the rest of your life. And I don't really like that because, the, I mean, depending on your definition of restrictive, you could say that is restrictive, sure. Um, I choose to do that. But the thing is, is, if it is restrictive to some people or it feels too restrictive, I want to let people know that you can eat a lot more than just ruminant meat. Um, and also, especially in one form, because not only do they think that you can only eat ruminant meat... It's like, oh, you have to only eat steak or something. And it's like one cut and that's it. But so so what is your diet composed of so that people know, hey, carnivore can still work without eating just, you know, a ribeye every single day? <laughs> yeah. See, so uh, I mean, we all know that millions of years we've evolved and we used to eat meats, right? Yeah. I don't know if we know exactly what kind of meat we were eating. We were hyper carnivores and all of that stable isotope studies have shown that, right? But there are also some stable isotope studies which have shown that there was a point in time where we were also having marine foods. Uh, yeah, so I think it was somewhere in Europe. I think uh, they did one one of those uh, stable isotope tests where they they found that we people were having marine. And I mean, yeah, you have the cave paintings, you have all the studies, and and but we can't be sure if they were having only red meat and only ruminant meat. We don't even know how the animals which were there at that time. Uh, so yeah, it seems you know, to I mean, depend on the. It seems to depend on the region. So depending on, it, it yeah. was, we're, we're hyper carnivorous, carnivorous almost invariably when you look at remains from pre agricultural revolution. Do the isotope analyses on yeah. those. Yeah. But depending on the region, the animal makeup was different. Like you were just saying, there's marine animals, yeah. and so depend depending on where you were from, and where you lived, and then more ruminant like reindeer and mammoths. Uh, I think in yeah. areas of Spain, for example. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, there was a wide variety anyway. So yeah, I mean, for me, uh, I, I can't get beef in India as as easily as uh, the US or the UK or any other country. Uh, there's just a few states where, where you can get beef. But yeah, so but we get buffaloes over here. Uh, so, you know, we have buff meat, we've got lamb, we've got goats. 
and, and most of the goats actually almost all the goats are actually grass fed you know so so that's good meat we have we have our chickens it's difficult to get uh, pasture raised chickens but we try our best and then we have a uh, seafood for sure prawns and uh, fish and in india's got a lot of coastal regions right so we have and, and there are a lot of rivers in india also so we have fresh water and salt water fish so wherever you might be in the country you would definitely have access to seafood or or uh, river fish and then uh, and and then eggs yeah so th- that's pretty much it that's what that's what i have sometimes i'll have some cheese sometimes i'll have a glass of milk uh and that's okay people might say that you know grown ups don't require milk and all that that's okay i mean uh fair enough that's a good point but sometimes i like to have my milk i'll have it i've fixed my metabolism i know that so you know there's no harm in having it once in a while right yeah i agree i was going to ask what your opinions were on dairy because when it comes to dairy that's sort of a hit or miss first of all a lot of people don't seem to deal with it that well uh, at least if they have a lot of it but also even if they do the worry with some people including including myself to a degree i still have it uh but whenever it comes to milk and heavy cream you can really overdo those because of the carbohydrate content in it um yeah. but i was going to ask so i i'm under the impression I don't know how much of industrialization has taken over India with respect to the byproducts like uh heavy metals in fish for example that's that's a worry in the United States that's a worry in other parts yeah. of the western world I don't know if that's as much of a worry with you guys as it is with us do you know about that I'm not sure I mean we we've got some I mean we 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 have a lot of fishermen who've been uh, who who catch the fresh catch of the day in the mornings right uh, i haven't seen much of industrialization right. in, uh, in 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 the marine food industry right now but there must be some fisheries which would be you know uh, farm feeding um, the fish and, uh, and 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 then selling that to us i'm i'm not sure but uh, i'm pretty sure somebody must be doing some research on that it's right. a good point i'm going to look into that for sure Yeah, that's the only that's the only thing that I personally worry about with even wild caught fish because then you've got the problem with farm raised uh you know the, where they feed fish corn and and soy where where it's like yeah. you know they were not eating that in the water right uh yeah. and then, but then you've got the wild caught um fish but then they're you know laden the bigger the fish the more mercury they have and yeah. so I usually tell people that if I in my personal opinion i would eat it like maybe once or twice a week and i actually do that sometimes and i try to prioritize yeah. the smaller fish um what about organs do you have any opinions that are strong about organs or or even not strong just what are your opinions about the inclusion of organ meats in the in a carnivorous diet i do have it i have it like okay. once a week i i don't overdo it i don't have it every day but just you know probably like 100 or 150 grams a week i i love the taste i uh, we know that you know they they're pretty high in nutrients uh but yeah i i i, I don't see uh, a complete contraindication <laughs> to uh, uh to organs uh, uh to each his or her own but uh, um, certainly you don't need to overdo it cuz you can get uh, my, uh, your uh, hypervitaminosis because of uh, eating too much of organs also Right. But yeah, I think a uh, hundred, hundred fifty grams or two hundred grams a week is not gonna uh, uh, do much harm. So we get we get mutton liver over here, and we get chicken liver. We get we get other other offals and stuff. So yeah, uh, sometimes if I want to have a nice full chicken, it comes with the organs, and just I just eat the whole thing up. Right. Yeah. So it's usually liver. So like the the worry that. of hypervitaminosis from organ meat seems to primarily not be organ meats as a whole it seems to mainly be liver because it's so concentrated which makes sense if you like the significance of the liver and physiology is extreme so the yeah. concentration of vitamins in it and minerals is going to be very very high um but yes i think that sometimes the worry can be a little inflated considering the fact that you know one bite of polar bear liver i've heard can kill you but it's not like that's the mm. case with cow liver or or anything like that yeah um and i have i i mostly have chicken liver and that's chicken, like once a week which is like s- that's much. yeah <laughs> that that's that's even that's even less of a worry i think yeah. um i'm surprised that you actually like the taste most people do not it's it's a very rare occurrence that people like the taste most of the time i've heard in the space that most people will force themselves to eat it because they think yo I, i have to eat it like once a week or something uh, and i tell them well hey you don't have to if you don't want to but yeah, if you think it have benefits yeah. then go ahead i've seen people sometimes they take like a shot of it or something they put it in a shot glass <laughs> try to down it 
So, so yeah, I mean, uh, like I told you, I was I was always a meat lover, and you know, since the age of two, I've been asking for meat whenever it was being cooked or not being cooked in the house. I would go around salivating just for just for my meats. So uh, I, I've always enjoyed the taste of flavor. I come from a family uh, who eats uh, a lot of meats. Uh, my my wife came from a vegetarian family, but now she's tired to enjoy her organs now. So yeah, that that was that was an acquired taste for her. How was how was that transition? Now that we, now that you just brought that up, I mean, was she was she was it for religious reasons or was it just because it was a cultural thing? It was a cultural thing in her family. Uh, I, I think her parents used to eat like really long time back, uh, but then they quit. So you know the whole family and some religious reasons also. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when we got married, she started having chicken and all, and then we moved to Bahrain, uh, where where she loved uh, the beef uh, the beef burgers at that time. But we were cooking a lot of beef also at that time in Bahrain. And uh, when we came, so I mean, through me, she's eaten all the meats that she can. And then I think this year itself, she started having liver once I told her that, you know, it can be good for you. Uh, so, yeah, and, and I think she's mixing it in uh, my son's meats also. He hasn't acquired the taste yet, but I'm sure he will. I was just about to ask so, you about that. Uh, I, th- I was going to ask if you, I thought that you had you had kids. Um, yeah. yeah. So, are, are are they carnivore, or do you usually do you just give them, you know, what they seem to what what other kids in the area seem to consume, and then are you going to have a plan where the older they get, you just teach them about things, and then you make them have their own choice as to what they'll. Yeah, so I have I have a son who's eight. I think the first four okay, years nice. we fed him a lot of junk food. Yeah, because because we didn't know better at that time. So I mean, he's had his uh, you know instant noodles and ice creams and pizzas and burgers and everything, everything possible. Like like all kids, unfortunately, do. And uh, but I mean, he now likes to call himself a carnivore. He loves his meats. Uh, very rarely has any rice or anything. But that's sometimes required because. Again, unfortunately, the schools, even in India, mm-hmm. think of vegetarian diet as a healthy diet. And uh, most of the schools allow only vegetarian food. So either you have school lunch or even if you want to get your home lunch, it's it's got to be vegetarian. So, I mean, my wife usually makes like egg fried rice for him. So, you know, she loads it up with egg. And uh, she's told the teacher that, you know, I have to give him egg. Uh, you know, I'm not going to give him anything which is not nutritious. Uh so yeah, but uh, again, I'm changing his his school, and again, the other school had these same issues, and I told them very very clearly that, uh, that he, I mean, I know that's a better school in terms of education, but then you know, if his health is going to be compromised, if you don't let me send him home lunch, I won't I won't shift him. So they've allowed right. that. Uh, they they want a letter from me. I'm going to let I'm going to write a really strong letter to them that you know you cook your foods in in seed oils and you're changing it every three months. Even if you don't change it, I don't give a damn. It's a health yep. hazard for my son. I know what it's going to do to him in the next three, four, five years. By the time he's fourteen, fifteen, he'll have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and and that's quite rampant in India right now in kids. So uh, yep. and, and obviously cause a lot of inflammation, and then you know by the time he's twenty, twenty-five, he's going to have a lot of other issues. So. No ways am I going to feed him the school lunch over there. Unfortunately, we can't send him uh, uh, carnivore food for school uh, for for home lunch. But then we're going to try and get like dairy. You know, we have cottage cheese and stuff, which is also high in protein. Uh, you know, home homemade. So you know, we're going to do that for him at least. Yeah. And then once he comes back home, he has his eggs, his chicken, his mutton, his fish, <laughs> whatever he wants. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, that's good. I'm so. I, so you, from what I understand, you can't actually you can't send him to school with a designed like like an actual made lunch of your um, desire. Really, you have to abide yeah. by their standards. That's interesting. I don't think. We- and that's sad, you know. I mean, because because I was I just started thinking how you know schools are your foundation, right? And it's not mm-hmm. just foundation for your education and how you grow up. It's also a foundation for your health. And right. the schools again believe the same propaganda. That you know, your plate should be colorful, and it should have fibers, and it should have carbohydrates, and it should be a balanced diet, cooked in the nonsense seed oils and refined oils, uh, and you know, low in fat. Again, that's that's again uh, a major concern. And you know, I mean, your your child goes to school for like ten, twelve years, and by by the time they're they passing out of uh, school, they're already probably pre-diabetic, which again goes undiagnosed. Yep. And uh, by, by the time they hit 25, 30, they start having other symptoms. And 35, 40, they've got full-blown diabetes or heart disease or hypertension or whatever, right. which is not right. So I think uh, the schools all over the world and even in India need to wake up 
to this fact at least we don't get a lot of junk food in school in the sense of you know uh, fizzy drinks or uh, or you know soft drinks there's some schools which may, might have that in their canteens but uh, most of the schools uh, don't have that at least yeah that's what we had whenever i was going to even I, it, like all throughout the entirety of my time going to school there they had an a la carte there was an a la carte line so you had your your regular school lunches and then you had the a la carte yeah. line where you could buy these massive homemade or well school made uh, cookies that were like freshly baked and everything. You had the you had the chocolate chip cookies and then you had the sugar cookies. As if the chocolate chip one wasn't a sugar cookie in and of itself. <laughs> it was loaded with sugar and all that stuff. And there was very little meat that they that they you know allow us to have there. You know that they themselves cook. And if it is, it's like chicken nuggets. You know, it's yeah. the basic you know <laughs> processed, fried, breaded stuff. So yeah, I mean, it seems like it's just a ubiquitous thing. Schools all across the nation. And, and like or across yeah. the world yeah. internationally yeah. It, it's just it it's just it's, seems it's, to be it's so it's so deeply indoctrinated you know that people and even i mean you have you have normal people friends just talking about okay you know we've had some junk food you know i I'll, I'll let my child have junk food you know it's it's it was always called junk food for a reason which never hit our brains and it, i i just believe it's not okay to normalize junk food for your kids forget about the no. adults right now but at least for your kids it's not okay to normalize it for them and you know, and then you see see that in their immunity, you'll see that they're falling sick more regularly. You know, uh, they have other kind of issues regularly. You know, they're on medications all the time, and 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 all of those are signs of you know your body just telling you, you know, give me some meat probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my friend, my best friend. Uh, whenever we were in school together, after every single meal that he would have, it he would because I, I had a class with him directly afterwards, and he would be. He, he wouldn't be able to keep his eyes open. He was, like, forcing himself to, like, stay awake. You know, because usually when, when you eat, when I've noticed, uh, I used to get like that sometimes, too. If I eat a huge carnivorous meal, my energy levels remain stable. And that never used to happen. I would I would binge on something else. And then I'd be, like, I'd be doing the same thing. I'd be, like, falling asleep in my chair. With, and there was, there was no, it's not like I let myself do it. It was completely unconsciously done. He was the same way. And then people were like, you know, Caleb. Like it was just, like, but you saw it after anyone ate anything, they were just falling asleep. Yeah. And they could not, they yeah. could not hold their heads up. Now, whether you want to attribute that to to blood sugar regulation problems, which I I would guarantee that that is one of the issues, or if you want to, yeah. you want to talk about the nutritional deficiencies, because that, well, yeah. that's another problem there. Well, for sure, yeah. both are going to be contributing to that, but. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, the, the school systems in many ways, but yes, we're we're going to talk about the the food. That's 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 yeah. a huge issue. You just talked about how it's a, it's the foundation. You you go to school to learn, but you can't learn if you are bereft of adequate nutrition and you also have unstable blood sugar levels because all you're going to want to do is fall asleep. <laughs> so so today today itself, I saw. Uh, I mean, I was just reading up on vitamin B12 deficiencies in India, mm -hmm. and I found a paper where you know 13.8 percent of preschool children had vitamin B12 deficiencies up to the adolescents who had 40%. Can you imagine? <laughs> preschool children are like three to four years old. They've already become B12 deficient. Yeah, that's, that's wow. Because they were not fed even during the pregnancies, after the pregnancies, mm -hmm. you know, once they were delivered. And then the, the, uh, the adolescents having 40% prevalence of, uh, obviously the end numbers were not very huge. It was one, in one city that they did that. And but that's going to be the story all all across the country. Thirteen percent is quite a bit for preschool children. They should not be deficient in any in any nutrient. Exactly. Yeah. No, I totally agree. We could probably talk about that for an hour straight because I've talked about it to other people before. It's just it's it's crazy. It's insane. Now there's this whole p push for homeschooling for multiple reasons. But at least yeah. you can guarantee that if you homeschool, you can feed them properly, right? You know exactly yeah. what they're being fed as well. <laughs> But exactly. Yeah. So where can so you have a podcast of your own? Uh, you want to talk about that, how that started, and then how can people find you on other platforms as well? Yeah. So I start off my podcast called the Desi E M Project. D E S I E M Project. E M stands for Emergency Medicine, and I started this off in 2021. I'd learned how to podcast in 2015. I'd gone to a faculty a development program in New York. And uh, but it took me some time to start my own, and uh, COVID happened in between and all of that. Yeah. So, but in 2021, that was basically I wanted to teach residents 
uh, regarding the new evidence-based methods of, uh, you know, how to deal with uh, some uh, some of the cases that we get, some of the myths and dogmas that are there even in emergency medicine, and even for the general public, you know, like, you know, uh, just to educate them when to use the emergency department and uh, don't just come in with a chronic pain that you've had for three years into the ED, you know, and, and, then, and then demand to be seen the first uh, you know, so, you know, it was all about how what emergency medicine is all about, how we join emergency medicine, and a lot of different drugs that we use, uh, and then, like like I mentioned, then, and then I, and once once I got into metabolic health, uh, I, I started to link the two of them together, because uh, I, I, I figured that as emergency physicians, we're actually saving them in that moment of time, but we don't know what's happening to them after that. You know, they mm -hmm. come in with probably zero medications and they go back on 10 medications and probably two months later or three months later, or maybe two years later, they're still on the same diet that they're having. And the and, and two to three years later, I can't save them. Right. You know, yeah. The medications are not going to help. I mean, they come in with a heart attack. A 25 year old comes in with a heart attack who's a pure vegetarian, has vitamin B12 deficiencies, has probably prediabetes because of all the carbohydrate intake, has a high homocysteine level and, you know, gets 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 a clot in the heart or something and uh, and it's because of the homocysteine not because of the cholesterol so uh, yeah so you know he comes in with zero medication and then he's put on statins which is again one of the po most poisonous drugs ever mm -hmm. and uh, you know and then two years later he has another heart attack and probably can't make it to the emergency department you know so yeah. I, I figured you know it's it's I won't say easier but uh, it's easier for the patient in, in the sense that, you know, they I, they won't need the lives to be saved if they actually reverse their metabolic syndromes and the non-communicable diseases by having the right nutrition. You know, I mean, they can get off all these medications. They can actually get cured. None of the medication that we prescribe you are going to cure you of your root cause. Right? Uh, all the associations are sponsored by all the pharmaceutical companies. All the books, all the curriculums are made by those pharmaceutical companies. They're the ones who are writing all the drugs. They're the ones who tell us what to prescribe, and we're doing that. But we're not curing anybody. So, I mean, that's not why I became a doctor. So then, you know, my, my podcast changed a little bit. A lot of people told me that your content is changing. And I was like, you know, it's not actually changing. It's, it's evolving because I've figured out that it's easier for me to, to work if I don't need to save your life. <laughs> you know it's right. you know it, you people need to think so you know I've started this tagline called help me save your lives by not coming into the emergency department you know you don't need to come into the ED unless you have a trauma but you don't need to come into the ED if you have if not a fully carnivore diet but at least a, a, a clean keto diet high fat high animal proteins very low carbs and and focus on your animal meats and and not on plants and vegetarian like in, in India if you see even a some somebody who we call a non-vegetarian would have meats like once a week or once a month, very rarely. But you know they're more plant-based. You know at least get more animal-based, eighty percent, ninety percent, whatever. That's actually going to help you reverse a lot of your syndromes, and then you won't need to come into the emergency department with diabetic ketoacidosis, hypoglycemia, strokes, heart attacks, Alzheimer's, dementia, hypothyroidism, PCOS, cancers. You know, so many things can get reversed. Yeah. So that's what my podcast is all about. So I get a lot of guests. You've been on my podcast. I'm getting Professor Bart K uh, soon. I've Good. Yep. chatted up with him. I'm getting Dr. Sean O'Mara uh, really soon. So that's awesome. going to be a fun one because he was also an emergency physician and uh, he's yeah. got into meta metabolic health. So that's going to be pretty awesome. Yeah, so we've, uh, I mean, that, that's the way that I'm, I'm going into, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just changing my content a little bit. And then people can get me on Instagram. So I put up... Uh, some cases that I see, anonymous uh, cases, obviously, uh, regarding uh, what I'm seeing in my emergency department and the chats that I'm doing. And so my, the carnivore.ep is what uh, people can follow on Instagram. These two are the major ones that I use. Uh, I'm on X, A-N-K-S-V. That's my uh, X handle, but I'm not, I'm not too, uh, too busy over there. But uh, yeah, the DCEM project and my Instagram. Okay, yeah, so whenever this is uploaded, um, I will link those in the description uh, of the video. Sure. Um, but with that being said, awesome. I mean, thanks for thanks for 
coming onto the channel as well. Uh, we talked about that once again last on, on our last interview. Um, I'll also link that if that I'm sure that that's already uploaded, of course. Uh, so I'll also yeah. link that in the description for anyone who wants to watch that. But with that being said, yeah, um, I'm sure we'll keep in touch. Um, yeah, through, absolutely, man. Yeah. But once again, yeah, yeah thanks for coming fun, on. It's been good fun, yeah. Thank you so much, Eddie, for having me, man. It's been a pleasure. Yeah.